Dzień dobry Państwu. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this meeting with Jagoda Grondecka. She is a journalist that everybody just slightly interested in international affairs must have heard recently as uh, she participated in the dramatic events of evacuating Afghans from Kabul after the collapse of Afghanis government and the takeover of power by the Taliban. Yagoda is a journalist. She used to live in Afghanistan for a year, almost. I would like to, we are supposed to talk about the situation of women in Afghanistan, but we should, I believe, start from more precise things. I would like to ask you, Jagoda, and my name is Ludwika Włodek, I should have introduced myself before. Do you remember a moment in time, in the days before your evacuation uh, on the 15th of August when Taliban entered Kabul, when you understood that the days of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan were numbered, did you expect it? Were there any milestones that made you understand it was the matter of days or hours. Could you tell us about those last, last days before the 15th of August? Ludwika, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, there was no one single moment. The last day before the 15th of August were very much chaotic. The situation was dynamic. I remember some week before the collapse of Kabul, I talked to a American journalist who came to there from uh, uh, Israel. She was worried. She didn't know what to do. I calmed her down. They only took one uh, uh, small capital province. They cannot take over uh, uh, the, the bigger cities like Kandahar. It, it didn't seem that th those uh, cities could be given in to Taliban. I remember when Kunduz, a very strategic city on the border, and after that, it all went as quickly, so quickly that I couldn't have, in, I didn't have enough time to put it on Twitter to report what has fallen. Just a couple of days before the 15th of August, we were sitting together with uh, my colleagues, we frequently met. We had there were final talks in Doha between uh, the Taliban and and uh, representatives of government. Hopes were very very tiny, but we still believed. Were those were, were they uh, uh, Afghans? Yes, they were. One of them was the uh, co collaborator of uh, Abdullah, who headed the delegation. There was a journalist, a, a guy from the ministry. And on that very evening, we still had those shreds of hope, but the, the mood was very much depressing. Uh, everybody was sad. We knew that the situation uh, wasn't heading in a good direction, though till the very last moment, nobody could believe that would happen the way it did. On the 15th in the morning, we learned that the Taliban had surrounded Kabul. They were all over the city. They declared they wouldn't take it over by force. They didn't want any casualties. They waited for the peaceful transition. There were some talks in the presidential palace about the, the temporary government with the uh, foreign minister from the uh, Karzai's government. I also believed it was most likely option. Everybody understood that the Taliban would have the leading role in that government, but there would be anyone else than them. However, in the afternoon, we had the information that the president had fled the country. and The city was very much upset. 
people traveled around Kabul trying to get some cash, which was like a miracle because banks had been short on money for, for some time. People trying to make some food supplies reserves. When the president left, had left, uh, uh, chaos started to rule. Police officers abandoned their post, dropped their uniforms, robbery started. That was a good excuse for the Taliban, as they said we hadn't planned to enter Kabul. We need to enter as peacekeeping forces. There is no president. There is chaos in the city. We need to take care of the inhabitant safety. That's why we need to enter. So in the morning, we woke up in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan with his government and the president. In the evening, when I wanted to go to the little store, on the corner, the Kabul was taken over. Well, daily matters. In the evening, wh were the stores closed? Or were the traffic jams with people trying to get away? Or was the city empty? Well, in the morning until early afternoon, the traffic was strong and it was quite chaotic. The Taliban and the still existing government appealed to the people to stay at home and await the deployment of situation, the only jumped road was that to the airport. Those who had any chance to leave with commercial flights uh, uh, were headed to the airport. They didn't make it anyway. The flights were cancelled because the Americans announced they were evacuating. It was very dramatic, as we know. So those people didn't have any chance to leave the country in normal conditions, which much speaks about the priority and privileges, because the Americans, in fact, occupied the airport for themselves. They went the only way out of the country. Nobody could fly. Night flights were blocked because the Americans said, we first. We go first. Yes, they blocked commercial and, and military flights. So uh, flights landed in neighboring countries. In the afternoon, the city went empty. Nobody knew what to expect. Everybody stayed at home. Stores were closed. The next morning, most places were closed. Very few stores operated. One supermarket. And on that very night, we had Al Jazeera's recordings from the presidential palace occupied by the Taliban. And then everybody understood. It was all over. The era that has been uh, there for 20 years was over. Generally, in Europe, it is not that only women are uh, endangered by the Taliban rule. It's not that they were absent there for 20 years and all of a sudden they are back. No, they have always been there for 20 years. They arranged to bomb explosions. They killed various targets. There were, so, there were always uh, some land of the country occupied by the Taliban. But you, in those last days, did you have any contact with women, your friends, people, ladies you would meet on a daily basis when you lived there? And um, has, was anything, anything different in their behavior? Uh, did they lose hope all of a sudden? Or were they ready for the situation? Or to the contrary, they said they would never surrender. I mean, the, the, the experience of contact with women for whom it is obvious that the Taliban government may mean an absolute change of their way of living, place in the society. Well, a remark, you mentioned the Taliban are a threat for women only a day or two days after the Kabul collapsed. A, a boy came to me whom I hired to help me at home, and he showed me bruises on his back, said the Taliban had done it to him for wearing European clothing, jeans and a, and a sweater, a sweatshirt. 
I had numerous uh, reports on such incidents, so it, was a, it wasn't unique. My uh, friends, female friends, who gained most in the past 20 years, who made their careers, who could educate, they, for many months, had had the feeling that they were betrayed, sold for the sake of a political agreement. In fact, it turned out there was no political agreement. The Taliban took everything. So the women felt abandoned, and they were very they had every right to feel so. The, the fight for the human rights were the, one of the leading slogans when we started intervention in Afghanistan. They keep, now my friends keep repeating they didn't believe that the Taliban's uh, claims they had changed. The foreign experts, uh, male and we, may, female experts, wanted to believe that they, they claimed the Taliban's did their homework, they wouldn't be so radicals, everybody's so enthusiastic about negotiations, pandings. Taliban told women stay at home for safety reasons, but soon they will be allowed to get back into the street, and everybody would print that, uh, repeat that as if a magic wand changed the Taliban's. Yes, and we had uh, reports all the times when uh, further provinces collapsed and people were running to Kabul and the women were told us, well, you told us about those exter internal refugees. You, you wrote about those uh, tent towns in parks in Kabul. Can you tell me what those peoples would say? The people said that they escaped at any price. They didn't want to live under Taliban's. At that time, nobody expected that Kabul would surrender so quickly. So people first escaped from smaller villages and towns to the province capitals. When the fight started there, they started to flee to Kabul. And then there was no escape from Kabul. But the people kept saying where well, the Taliban had taken over the power, mind you, they had controlled some areas long before that time. A year ago, in October last year, I was in some villages in Kunduz that all the time were under Taliban control, and women kept telling us how the Taliban prevented them from leaving homes, ordered them to leave offices, forbade them working, how the elderly were supposed to make lists of unmarried girls between 12 and 18, Many women were afraid about the fate of their children, especially girls. I spoke to a friend from Afghanistan whose wife is a teacher, and she was terrified. She didn't know what to do. She was a teacher in classes where the girls were 17 and 18, and the Taliban would come every day to school. She could teach, but they would come and see if the girls were coming and they were checking the attendance, and they were looking for candidates for their future wives. And she didn't know if she should inform the parents not to send children to school. The Taliban were checking if the girls were present. If not, they, they would look for them. So the Afghan women kept repeating repeating the situation would never be better. They didn't believe it. They kept talking about their experiences. I don't know. And we just didn't believe it. We preferred to be naive, uh, believing what the Taliban were saying, because they said that they wouldn't be repeating what used to be back in the 1990s, that we were bombarded with information that um, this is actually happening in other parts of the world and all kinds of declarations from Taliban's were clashed with reality and did not oh, true. The Taliban's initially declared that the women were allowed to have rights. Yeah, back in 1996, they declared the same. Some people were old enough to remember it. They were saying that women can go out, go to work. Quickly enough, it turned out not to be true. 
The spokesman of Taliban said that they can stay home for their own safety because they were not able to train uh, their fighters how to deal with women. It's not enough to give them PowerPoint presentation on how to deal with women. women. Women are being erased from the public space. Many of them, whenever possible, they leave home. It's too scary for them. Some of them were pushed to stay home. Out of 100,000 employees of public administration, 150 women uh, were women. Quite a big group of people, they are supposed to stay home before right conditions of work are supplied, provided the same as in 1990s. No herald of any change of Taliban's being less radical, sexism, misogynism. This is one of the traits of this formation. They cannot take a step back. Let's talk about perspectives and what is happening now. I'd like to ask you about your decision, why you decided to settle in Kabul at the time you were there. I met Yagoda in March in Kabul. And when I was talking to my friends about Yagoda, hiring a home in Content Parwan, and she left her on her, on her own, on their own device. And they said, uh, your lady friend renting a house. These are Afghans, two families renting a house because they are afraid to live there on their own. So the question is, for many months that you were staying in Afghanistan, did you think this to be a threat for you? You made an informed decision, knowing what the situation was like. Did you think about it? Did you check pros and cons on the one side, you as a journalist, on the other side, your personal safety of a person who might be hijacked for ransom or killed, as an example, being a Western country journalist who has been a nosy packer, as they think. How did you think about your stay there? Two weeks before leaving, I moved to a protected building flat because I was afraid of petty crime, because safety situation deteriorated, economic situation deteriorated. So my threat was, there's a foreigner living in this house, so there might be some kind of high-value commodity that can be stolen. I always realized it. Uh, I was talking to my boyfriend because, uh, well, I was not afraid. You don't have to break into the house. Uh, it's enough to wait for me to go out into the street. It's easy to spot me wherever I am in the city. For the year that I was staying here, I observed the situation related to safety and security, its deterioration. You could see it clearly. Different activities were changing. When you compare people doing things before and after, like going out, eating out, restaurants, parties, one of the harbingers of Taliban's coming was the recall it was the third day before uh, collapse of a Thursday event. It had only happened once. And on top of that, local alcohol dealer was arrested. So for practical reasons, you couldn't have this party. It was a kind of vent for people. The possibility to spend time with people to recover your mental health, because a Thursday was a day out. Thursday, because of Friday is a day off. So it's Thursday, not Friday, like in heavy air culture. And the last th Thursday, there was this WhatsApp news. Because of what was happening, 
the party was postponed time indefinite as you can imagine never have we had this party tell us where's the idea from why did you decide to move into Kabul for some time when I was studying I got interested uh, interested with uh, this country I was writing my MA thesis on Afghanistan studies, never defended it. I wanted to work in a country with my command of English, of language, Iran. You cannot be accredited if you're a freelance foreign journalist. Afghanistan seemed interesting. The war seemed to be a thing of the past. Rarely did people write about what was happening there no Polish journalists, so I thought to myself it would be nice to fill in the niche. It was a year before the 11th of September anniversary, so it would be nice to have a close look on impact of an anti-terrorism war that continued for 20 years. 2019, It was try and test period. I returned and said to myself, I want to stay a bit longer. Please tell me what comes as a funny thing when you go places to Afghanistan. I'm speaking about journalist perspective. You paid attention to things that were wrong, to things that are not operational women. Few people know it in Poland. Afghanistan was pro-women country that had a constitution that guaranteed equal rights for genders. There were institutions that women could uh, pursue their rights, like High Commission for Human Rights, uh, Women's Ministry. Many journalists, and female journalists in particular, when they were describing the situation in Afghanistan, they indicated the things that did not work, how bad the situation was for the women. After the 15th of August, they started showing that it was not that bad. Did you have a feeling of this kind? That accentuation was different. How would you assess the Afghan women situation at the time of Ghani's government? I know it's a difficult question because which Afghan women, but if you could labor a point, it's not like huge revolution that rolled over the country 20 years ago. There are many Afghan ladies who lived in Pashtuni villages, quite conservative. They had had the same position. They were closed at home. They might have gone to the river to get some water. It was a home chore for women. They were not a part of a social life. For sure, there was a group of women that we know that have benefited from this 20-year period. They gained something they wouldn't have had without the reality change and the intervention. Some of these gains were lost. So apart from the elite who had the chance to obtain education and enjoy a career in private sector, education, journalism, activists, Human Rights Watch and similar institutions check it that in province, towns, the attitude of Afghan has changed. So for example, towards education of uh, girls, look at the statistics, how many girls attended schools at Taliban times and later. Then it was dropping. It was associated with the safety situation deterioration. Many Afghan families believe that it's worth educating ladies, sending them to school, but it was too dangerous. It was too dangerous to go to school. It was too dangerous to be at school because 50% of schools had no buildings. They were tented or in shelters. So they didn't want to send people over to the place which has no fence or wall. On numerous occasions, there were attacks on schools, Afghan schools. 
with many Afghan work, with Western countries' help, we could see a big change about women changing their roles. We can see the images from Kabul. The women keep protesting. They are not going to give up on their rights, on what they have gained over 20 years period. They're brave enough because when you hit the street, when you face Taliban's, when you call for your rights, this is bravado. It requires you to be truly courageous, but it shows how desperate these women are. Who are. Everything they were working for is torn off of their hands. Little help do I see, little hope do I see. Uh, the situation cannot improve. Hardly can we improve what has been built over two decades. They might be desperate, but they are furious. When you watch the films, you can see that they are screaming out loud. They yell. They are quite decided. Nothing do they look like uh, the Afghan ladies uh, presented in Western media that are princesses like that there is this Prince Charming that saves them. I want to ask about what is happening now. The Taliban organized the counter demonstration on Saturday. You could see that. Say a few words and comment on that, please. What's your perception? How do you see troops of women wearing black abai? Spontaneous, seemingly. Never in Afghanistan haven't I seen ladies wearing anything of this kind. We don't know how these women are affiliated, who they are. Are they really women or are these Afghan men? I was reading Afghan journalist coverage. One of these meetings were at the university. The ladies wearing this, uh, their attires were brought at the university and sat next to flags to exercise uh, their support. And he was told by one of the university students to be gathered there to wear these things. If they don't do it, they'll be chucked out of the university. They'll have no chance to study. So it's hard to refuse this kind of uh, proposal. Yeah, you cannot reject it, you know. For all the time, there were voices of Western journalists or specialists. How about Afghan ladies who want to work burqas, who has always been conservative? So the basic difference in this situation is that they were allowed to do so for the last 20 years. If they wanted to stay home to wear this kind of attire, There were no problem to that, but year in the round, there were fewer and fewer of them. Sorry for chopping in. The posters at demonstrations are the, um, the most important. If the, they are all the same, it means that they have been given. So they were quite spontaneous. They were carrying different posters, some of them printed, others highlighted, drawn on cardboard box. Yeah, it was not a demonstration where they were given the posters of the same uh, type. It's been a month since you left. What do you miss the most? What do you think about? Do you have flashbacks of particular scenes or days? Or do you crave for any scent or dish? I haven't had time to think about it. It's been too fast. The situation, the necessity to leave. I was torn out of the place I had been living for a year. At the airport, there was this kind of quite striking event. We were the first group to evacuate. Many people that I knew personally, you know them too. So 
we were the elite leaving the country, doctors, translators, interpreters, doctors, people who had been working to change the Afghanistan for the previous two decades, and there were Talibans running around us, hitting people with anything they had with the butts of uh, their rifles. And I felt frustrated and infuriated looking at our group, bearing in mind the fact that these are the people that we are taking from the country. But their work, their endeavors is goes down the drain and we leave Afghanistan in the hands of such people, Taliban commanders who were at this people. So I felt uh, infuriated that it's happening. So, so like these women's women, they had been given lots of promises. They had different hopes. They were developing future perspectives. They were hoping to have the future coined up for their daughters. They did believe in their life being different from what they did remember from the previous Taliban ruling times. And it took just a few months to make it go down the drain, to waste it without any perspective that it's changed. If you were supposed to decide whose fault is that? Can can we consider fault here? Well, the, each party made many mistakes. I don't want to purify the government. The Afghani were also mad at the government, believing it was corrupted. Much of what happened in in uh, Afghanistan is the fault of both president's administrations. There were many mistakes and errors of every, every, every aspect that altogether contributed to what happened. And the direct cause for those events, what we observed in the past weeks, was the awful agreement between Trump and the Taliban signed behind the Afghan government because he wanted to make a deal quickly. So he consented to all the demands from the Taliban, and he got nothing in return. They got everything as a gift and the Afghan government had no negotiation position, so it took a year for the facade election talks that brought nothing. I remember that after nine months, after one of those rounds of negotiations, there was one sheet, A4 in size, with uh, uh, what they achieved and what they are going to talk about now. You could see it was nothing. It was only the Taliban's winning time until the Americans have left and they could have the country for themselves only. There are some minor but also important issues, the, the volume and types of armament left by the Americans. They never took it with them nor bombarded the bases. They have more tanks than 85% of uh, countries in the world, so they are now politically stronger in the in, in 1990s. They are military stronger, psychologically stronger. They know that after 20 years of war with the only global superpower and the Western world, we are withdrawing as losers. They are the winners, so they will not be willing to go even a smaller step backwards and to give up on what they have won. Though I believe they must have been surprised by the pace of their offensive and how quickly they conquered city after city. In one of the, or one of the interviews, the spokesperson, they wanted to win a province, but, but they won all of them. Yes, I believe that since Biden said they would leave Afghanistan no matter what, even though everybody knew that the Taliban didn't uh, uh, keep the uh, conditions, the, the ceasefire, 
from that very moment, it was like like a domino collapsing. And since April, it was a continuing march after Taliban. I remember when we both went there, before that, I hadn't seen that picture on the wall you did of the artistic uh, group Lords of Art, which on one of these concrete walls in Kabul left erected to prevent bomb attacks uh, made by uh, the Taliban. There was a picture, a painting from the peace negotiations where the American representatives in the negotiations uh, an Afghan by birth who on the left brought being a young man when he was holding the hand of a Taliban representative and the, the slogan, we see you. Uh, on the other hand, the, the meaning that we know you are making a deal on, on a bad affair. The Afghan had this feeling. How do you know, how, how do you feel they they were sold somehow? Yes, that was the strong feeling among the Afghans. They didn't decide about themselves. It was somewhere above their heads. M bigger interests were on stake, and whatever solutions would there would be wouldn't be convenient for them. But they couldn't affect it. Obama and uh, was frequently uh, criticized by Trump for his decision on withdrawing troops from Afghanistan uh, for providing dates to withdraw. Trump shouted, you should decide based on military situations rather than the calendar, while when he could, he did exactly the same. He said uh, the Americans would withdraw by that very date, and he said, uh, the Taliban said that if, if that date is succeeded by one uh, uh, day, they would treat it as war because they uh, suspended attacks on uh, U.S. troops for a year based on the contract. So when the contract was signed, it was the final word for the Afghanistan. But Biden still could say, you didn't keep the terms and conditions. We are breaking the contract. Uh, and we'll keep so our military presence and we will press on the Taliban to get a solution. The fact that the Americans would need to terminate the mission uh, and withdraw was understood and agreed also by the Afghans. They said they, the Americans have been with us for 20 years. We are grateful for what they did, but now we need to take our fate in our hands. We need to take control of our country. Nobody would ever claim the Americans would need to stay for next two decades, but the withdrawal could take different forms. The, the best variant, unfortunately, was chosen, especially that was 11th of uh, September, the, this anniversary, and the feeling that so much time, so much energy, human lives, it, it's all nothing, and was spectacularly lost. Thank you. I don't know what the formula is. Do we allow questions from the audience? We have some six minutes left. If anybody has a question, I could give the floor quick, precise questions so Yagoda can quickly answer them. I wanted to ask about the Taliban. Afghanistan is a diversified country in terms of uh, ethnic groups. Are Taliban mostly from one ethnic representation or are they different? And the second question, what do you think about the aid, humanitarian aid, now that will be now necessary for Afghanistan. The first question, yes, they are from the dominating Pashtun group. 
that's the absolute majority of Taliban's without any official statistics, they are Pashtuns. And many representatives of other groups, Tajiks, Uzbeks, Khazars, stressed that in fact that was an ethnic conflict, that the president and majority of the government were Pashtuni. And because of that, they supported the Taliban somehow. They were ready to sell the country. That's what the Tajiks would say. The Pashtun sold us again. Uh, the, the humanitarian aid, yes, Afghanistan now in a very poor condition. Hunger, starvation, uh, poverty, that would be necessary. So there is a huge challenge between international, among, uh, before international community, how to give that aid without sanctioning the government, without expressing any support for it, yet so that regular everyday people do not suffer. As we know from Iran, sanctions on the government mostly hit those regular citizens. The, as our government, communist government spo spokesperson said, the government will feed. I would have a question too. What's the issue of the internet in Afghanistan using smartphones of any means of communications for regular people? And the second thing, media access, what it's going to look like. We believe that the Taliban in the first uh, presentation, there was no, no TV. TV was banned. What about music? Music, we remember that during the first uh, uh, government, they forbade uh, playing music, listening to music. They killed musicians. The internet in Kabul was very expensive in Kabul. I paid a hundred US dollars for one gigabyte of internet. So you can imagine many people couldn't afford it. I know the Afghans would buy subscriptions for their iPhones, they could only access the Facebook or some other website. Hundred dollars for one gigabyte? Perhaps terabyte. No, I swear. When you put a SIM card with the speed Something must be wrong. It was frustrating because the speed was terrible. It hardly ever reached what was guaranteed. It lacked, I believe, no access. But there were smartphones. The richer people could afford the same models we have in Europe. Many couldn't afford, but there was the internet, the media. Yes, the Taliban, during their first rule, had only one radio station, Radio Sharia, uh, with the Sharia propaganda. Now, in many places where they entered, they started closing local radio and TV broadcasters. Initially, they promised the journalists would be able to work regularly. Only a couple of weeks later, we can see they can't. Western journalists are for, forbidden to travel around the country. The journalists are locked in prison, so they are bitten, tortured. So another great sacrifice for the freedom of media, access to information, to what is happening in Afghanistan. Music, I hear confusing reports. Much depends on, in particular, provinces, towns, villages. It depends not on the, the top government, but rather local commanders and what they consent to. If they consent to live or uh, uh, played music uh, during weddings, 
many of the Taliban are young boys who will not even remember the first rule of the Taliban. I believe they do not really understand why they would uh, prohibit people from using TV, music, radios, something they use. But they have the sense of being a Taliban. They understand they have to do it. They have to smash sad dishes. But they don't understand the purpose. The Taliban did change together with the changing technology. They started to use the social media. They published statements on the Twitter. But in, I heard from Kabul that uh, live music is forbidden or some other practices are returning. My friend's hairdresser said uh, uh, Taliban came to his uh, uh, parlo and said no more beard shaving, forbidden. Well, the Taliban uh, know how to play the media well, how they entered the capital and took over the power, the media presentation, the interviews to journalists, which meant they forced the journalist to interview them. It only shows they will try to use the media for their own benefit. Now, of course, there are no more women on the media, mostly. The state television, I don't know if you saw that, they mostly broadcast religious singing. I, I, I never had a TV, but I, I heard. There are no female hosts, no music. It's, it's getting back 20 years to 20 years ago. Well, the time has up. I do recommend that you follow Yagoda on social media, regular media, and just keep an eye on Afghanistan because this is our human obligation to see what is happening worldwide. Thank you very much for this meeting. Enjoy uh, the day and the Freedom Games. All the best to you. Thank you. It's not always easy to recognize. It may look like this, or like this. It may be a burden, but it is a responsibility that we embrace nonetheless. But if it means this for one person and this for someone else, maybe it ultimately means being there for one another. It isn't handed to us, but we know where to find it and how it feels, how it tastes, and what it sounds like when we finally have it. It means different things to different people, but for many, it means everything. And if we all fight for it, it will eventually bring us together.
Work is different now. We're commuting less, virtually meeting more. Separating work life and life life can feel challenging. It's easy to forget that to thrive at work, we need to take care of ourselves. Microsoft Viva Insights offers new experiences to balance productivity and well being. Personal insights help you stay at your best and most productive. Add structure to your remote workday by opting for a virtual commute, carving out time to have a productive start in the morning and mindfully disconnect in the evening. Protect time before your calendar fills up for focused work, coaching, and learning. Take regular mental breaks with Headspace, tapping into dedicated moments of mindfulness. Use emotional check-ins to tune into your day-to-day -day mindset and well-being. Strengthen team bonds with Stay Connected experiences that prompt you to praise collaborators, schedule one-on-ones, and follow up on pending commitments and outstanding tasks. Insights for managers and leaders offer windows into how work happens and the impact on employee well-being. Identify where teams may be isolated and take action to break down silos. Quickly discover opportunities to prevent burnout, promote coaching and development, and boost engagement. You and your team's well-being is important, especially in times of change. Taking care of one another allows you to thrive and your organization to build resilience. Experience how new well-being insights in Viva can help. Liberté Talks. To, co ważne. Seria Liberté Talks realizowana jest dzięki wsparciu Google oraz Państwa darowizną. Na podcast Podcast z Klimatem zaprasza Jakub Wiech.